Welcome to this week's episode of Compound Your Knowledge, where we go over research from our blog at alphaarchitect.com. This week, we're going to take you through a paper I wrote. It's called, What's the Story Behind EBIT to TEV? I have, as always, Dr. Jack here to help me explain some of the research. We're just, uh, I'll start you kind of with how we opened up the paper is, uh, it's a common question we often get at Alpha Architect, which is why do you guys focus on EBIT to total enterprise value as a value screen for stocks instead of the more traditional measures such as book to price? Um, we, we, uh, Wes had, had given a quote in the book, uh, Quantitative Value, where he said, as Benjamin Graham, the intellectual founder of the value investment philosophy states in his classic text, The Intelligent Investor, investment is most intelligent when it is most businesslike. We feel that EBIT to total enterprise value is a more businesslike way of uh, looking at what, what a company's worth. So let's take a step back here, Jack. Can you describe for us what is EBIT, E-B-I-T? Yep, so EBIT is generally referred to, when you say that, it's supposed to mean like operating income, right? And so that generally means, you know, revenue that the firm generates minus cost of goods sold, and then minus, you know, uh, SG&A. Um, and that's generally what you call your operating income. So uh, that's the short answer. Yeah. So with, with eBay, you're, you're trying to capture the profit, profitability of a business, um, regardless of if it's Google's, Macy's, Netflix, or a donut shop, right? So it's just a simple way to say, hey, how much is this company earning? Uh, from, we, op, from operations. Yep. From operations. And we contrast that with some measures like book to market might not capture the value of an IP uh, driven firm like Google, um, but EBIT doesn't have that problem, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but so let's go to the second half of that then, Jack. We kind of understand now what EBIT stands for. Mm -hmm. What does total enterprise value stand for? Or T so, Yeah, so total enterprise value, the simplest way to think of it is it is if I wanted to go out and buy the firm today, how much would I need to to buy it right and so now how do you come up with the value for total enterprise value well you know let's say you wanted to go and buy mcdonald's right so if you wanted to go buy mcdonald's what would you do you'd go out and buy all the market cap so you'd say gotta buy all the stock right gotta so buy market stock. cap yep i gotta buy all the debt so market cap plus debt right you gotta buy out if there's any minority interest preferred shares you add them in mm -hmm. right and then last, if there's any like excess cash or basically cash, cash equivalents and excess short term liabilities, right, you essentially subtract that all because if you bought the entire company, you essentially would receive that cash and put it back in your pocket. Right, right. Because if, if you want to control the full, you know, earnings power of the company, it, you know, and if you just buy the market value, well, guess what? The debt holders still have claims on those earnings, correct? Well, yeah. So remember, EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes, mm -hmm. right? So obviously the interest where debt holders uh, receive some interest, uh, like they're going to receive their interest after EBIT. Yep. Um, but but TV and, and why like EBIT, the total enterprise value, generally people call it the business buyer metric, right? Is because it's basically saying, okay, how much money does the firm from operations make? And then how much is the firm worth, right? So that's really like, if you wanted to buy the firm, you can kind of tell very quickly, okay, the firm makes a million dollars a year. And if it costs 10 million to buy the entire firm, including the debt, then that's like a 10% yield on its normal operations. Right. And then what are, you know, I guess, what are some issues with book to market or, or other metrics? Yeah, so again, every metric is going to have issues yep. uh, specifically. So book to market, right? There's um, 
let's just focus on maybe some issues on book to market. One is, you know, what do you do when you get like negative book values, right? Yep. So a, a current example is Starbucks. And you might be like, well, hey, how does Starbucks have negative book value? Well, you know, what happened is recently uh, they had raised a lot of debt and repurchased a ton of shares. And just the way mathematically, when you compute book equity, it went negative, right? Yep. So now you're trying to compare a negative, so you have some issues there, right? You have yeah. to make adjustments or just kick the firm. Uh, other issues are, well, hey, is book value indicative of the true value of the assets? So I'll give you like two competing examples. So one would be like financial firms, mm -hmm. right? So financial firms are actually, in general, their book value should be somewhat representative of the true value of their assets, right? Um, and that, that's because, you know, they have to write, like, if you look recently, a lot of financial firms during this coronavirus thing have been writing down some of the value of some of these things, right? So they're, they're like kind of marking it to what they think the real value is. Whereas like an alternative is, let's just take, I'm going to pick Insta, uh, Facebook, for example, yeah. right? Like what's the book value of Facebook's uh, assets? So you got a lot of intangibles here, but I'm going to like cherry pick one specific item, which is like Instagram. Yeah. Right? So I think Facebook brought, bought Instagram for, it was like two or 4 billion. So it was like a lot of money, right? Yeah. But representative or relative to what it's probably worth today. Yeah. Right? If, if you were like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go buy Instagram today, you might think that that thing is the, the value of that is probably like, you know, 100 to 200 billion. I'm just yeah. Yeah, round yeah. numbers here. Yeah, but yeah. if you look at Facebook's book value, they don't have the book value that high, right? right? So what happens is on these IP things, you can have issues where the book value might not be representative of like what the true value of the assets of the firm are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you're trying to, you know, when, when you're using earnings before interest and taxes, you're saying, we're going to count like whatever income operating income Instagram's able to generate. Well, we're, we're seeing that, right. Yeah. Whereas book value, you're, yeah. I mean that, that, that value of, uh, of Instagram is, isn't showing up in that, in that, um, yeah. in, in the value of the firm. So, uh, yeah, so you, you can just miss things in this newer economy. Um, there was a, well, yeah, there, there was a quote I had in the paper. It was from a writer at Barron's and that's what they got towards. They said, but there's a problem with price to book today's economy. Price to book, perhaps the most conventional measure of value, evaluates stock prices based on a company's book value, the worth of all tangible assets, but no intangible ones. Price to book and similar accounting based metrics worked better in an industrial based economy when companies owned valuable tangible assets like manufacturing plants and equipment. Today's service economy is filled with companies whose biggest assets are their brands, intellectual property, IP, or customer loyalty, which, which don't show up on the balance sheet, which is, you know, that's, um, that's the examples you just gave Jack with Facebook and Instagram as an easy one, right? There's a whole lot of intellectual property and brand power that uh, um, yeah. Facebook has that, that may not show up in its, uh, uh, if you were judging it by purely its book value. Yeah. Um, well, same with Starbucks, right? Yep. The, the, what's the value of the assets of people coming in every day? Even yeah. during coronavirus, I've seen drive-through lines backed up onto the main road here, which just seems crazy to me. But people are still going to get their Starbucks in their drive-through, right? Right. So and I know, and I just use—I mean, when you think of the value of brands, just—I mean, think of Apple. If you yeah. if you told me I could use Apple's brand to do anything, I mean, I you know, I could I I know I could make money on that, right? I could go sell. Apple sneakers, like, or Apple wine bottles. I mean, who, you know, you just slap the Apple brand on something and you're, you're going to sell. Right. So like, clearly there's value being generated from that, um, not captured in book value, but that may be getting captured by, cause you're able to see it in, in the earnings of the company. Um, and then also, yeah, you know, with, with total enterprise value, since you're subtracting out that cash, um, uh, if these, you know, these 
big tech companies and things like that, if a company is sitting on a ton of cash, um, that's going to be taken into account too, which I think is kind of important. Um, so, and that is kind of what's able to be seen. If you go uh, and read the paper, I had two charts from our portfolio architect tool and on the Y axis. So, you know, further up you go, it, it meant the bigger a company is. Um, and on the uh, X axis, I had the book to price. So the further to the left you went, the more expensive a uh, company was, the further to the right you went, the more undervalued a company was. Um, but I, I just pulled up the all the stocks in the S&P 500 market cap weighted, right? So um, at the top left hand corner, when you look at a chart by um, book to market, you see that pretty much all the tech stocks look either expensive or extremely expensive um, by book to price. If you looked at that same chart by EBIT to total enterprise value, what you would see is that the Amazon <laughs> still looks very expensive, um, but the other uh, tech stocks start to drift more towards the middle in terms of you know whether they're undervalued or overvalued. Um, and then Facebook actually went all the way down. You know, it's in the top 50% cheapest stocks uh, at the time when I pulled this data, and it, you know it was overlapping with Berkshire Hathaway, a, a firm that I think most people would kind of intuitively understand to be a value play. Um, so what we're getting at with these charts is depending on the valuation screen you use, you do wind up with a different basket of stocks, right? Not every value stock or value screen is gonna lead you to the same place. Um, Jack, would you have anything to add around that general idea? Yeah, I mean, it's that's good. That's true. So, you know, depending on the value metric you use, you're going to come up with different names. So, for example, book to market historically is probably and definitely the past 15 years has been overweight kind of financials mm -hmm. and a little bit energy at times. Financials, as we kind of mentioned, you have to actually, you know, adjust your book value of your assets from time to time. Right. So if you notice, Berkshire was pretty cheap on book to market. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas when you go to a, a more earnings based measure, um, such as, you know, we use EBIT over total enterprise value. You could also just use simple earnings per share divided by price, right? Um, like the, the PE multiple, right? That That's, I would say, similar to EBIT TV. But mm -hmm. when you use that, you're going to come up with different types of firms. And you're right, like Facebook on EBIT to TV and even like PE is actually kind of cheap. Uh, or at least as of the time we ran this. Yeah, it's, it has, I know since I wrote this, it ran up in price in a pretty big way. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know the numbers, but I don't, I, I'm confident it's not, uh, you know, as undervalued as it was um, by that screen now. Uh, yeah, so should have bought when I wrote this, I guess. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and then there's you know there's a whole lot of other issues, right? It's 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 always tough to talk investing because uh, there's so much nuance and other things like that. So we're trying to keep this higher level just to get a general idea across of how um, value screens lead you to different places, right? Because what else matters? Well, things like concentration. How much? How how many stocks do you choose to own? Are you going to own, you know, the top ten percent by? EBIT to total enterprise value? Are you going to own a top 50% by book to market, right? Um, concentration is going to lead to very different things. What's your weighting scheme? Equal weighting, market cap weighting, revenue weighting, right? How are you going to weight the thing? Um, so there's a there's a whole lot more of nuance, but we, we wanted to give you some insight into um, uh, you know one, one, uh, one area that we do feel is one of the more important ones. Um, what else we got, Jack? Anything? No. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally agree. You know, how you get to cheap is important, right? And then obviously, you know, we prefer once you get to cheap to have some sort of a quality screen on top of that, right? Because every single metric is going to have an issue, right? You know, yeah. you could say, hey, you know, PE multiples can have issues if you have too much debt, right? Yeah. Possibly because you can look cheap on PE but be have a ton of debt. Well, 
EBITDA TV, right? You know, recently, like obviously you can have firms that the TV is part of the debt, but uh, you know, if you have a ton of interest, possible like cash flow issues, clearly during like coronavirus, mm -hmm. uh, that can be an issue. But you know, by throwing that extra quality filter on top, hopefully that gets rid of at least some of the some of the issues that go around with uh, some of the, the value metric you're using. Right, and and I, and I just close this. So yeah, that's a good point too. You know, yeah, there's other things you can do with these value screens. You can put a quality screen on. Um, yeah, like I said, concentration. But at the end of the day, you know, there is no necessarily right answer. We wish there was some magic answer. Um, some things are going to do better some years. Some things are going to do better other years. But but we believe and this is what I closed it with, we believe in the persistence of value investing because for almost every data set, and I, and I have a source link to this, you know, you can click through, but for almost every data set for any asset class we can find, value investing seems to have worked, right? So that tells you the persistence of it. And we believe in uh, EBIT to total enterprise value over other value screens, um, because we just believe it's more intuitive and broadly applicable to invest in today's economy. Um, but yeah, as, as I went on to say, systematic value investing doesn't start and end on the, on the value metric though, unfortunately. Um, so if anybody wants to talk about what the other characteristics you can do, um, yeah, please reach out. Other than that, uh, I think that's all we've got. Good, good by you, Jack. Works for me. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys, uh, to compound your knowledge, and we'll see you again soon. The views expressed in this recording are the personal views of the participants as of the date indicated and do not necessarily reflect the views of Alpha Architect itself. Nothing contained in this recording constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice and should not be viewed as a current or past recommendation or a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or to adopt any investment strategy. The information in this recording is based on current market conditions which will fluctuate and may be superseded by subsequent market events or for other reasons. Alpha Architect does not resume any duty to update forward-looking statements. The information in this recording has been developed internally and or obtained from sources believed to be reliable. However, no representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made or given by or on behalf of Alpha Architect as to the accuracy and completeness or fairness of the information contained in this recording. Any liability as a result of this recording, including direct, indirect, special, or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. Copyright 2018, Alpha Architect LLC. All rights reserved.